Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all, all of you today. I guess once again, a nice gray day. <laughs> um, let's see, what do we have here? Um, well, I often hear from uh, uh, people, oftentimes people that follow us on Zoom or or so many of you as well, but um, I get emails and, and uh, letters occasionally. And uh, there's one fellow, I was gonna just say a young man, but he's actually not that young anymore, I don't think, but middle age, I suppose. But um, uh, to me, at my age, everybody seems kind of young, <laughs> I think. Um, so I am older than I looked. You might think I'm younger than I than I am. I don't know, but um, anyway. But I, I I've gotten to know this fellow over the last couple of years, a little bit through exchanges, and he very often makes very interesting observations. And um, so this morning, he just sent me something a couple of weeks ago, and I thought this is very good what he had to say here. And it occurred to me that I, I could say a few things about his comments here and uh, might provide the basis of a talk here. So that's what I'll be doing uh, today. Uh, his name is uh, Jamie Douglas and he lives in England and uh, very interesting uh, fellow uh, based on the exchanges we've had and I've talked with him, too, on Zoom, personally, one-on-one. -on -one. So I feel like I've gotten to know him a little bit, uh, though I've never actually met him in person. Uh, but let me just read this to you, what Jamie sent me a couple weeks ago. He said, there is no, <laughs> there is no ending to this practice, is there? Because there is no end to things being taken to be things and then revealing themselves to be empty. Even the practice and the teaching itself, which is almost like one of those self-destructing letters in spy movies that fizzles up after reading. Yet in the case of this practice, it never stops fizzling up. There really isn't an it to be found here, there, or anywhere. Over time, Insanity reveals itself. The insanity of departing from here, looking for something to bring back to here. The insanity of thinking that thinking can see better than seeing can. The insanity of thinking that things can actually self-exist and that therefore there can be enduring mystery and opacity. And so the insanity of the enduring spiritual search. Well, I thought that was quite a series of observations that he made here. Uh, and there's a lot there, a lot behind what he's saying. And uh, in exchanges I've had with him, uh, I would say that uh, uh, Jamie has a pretty good understanding. Um, but he says, there is no end to this practice, is there? You know, very often, people will ask about this way, this practice, when they begin to take it up, uh, they might ask, well, well, how long before I reach whatever it is that you're reaching for, searching for? Yeah, well, how long? But actually, if you... Uh, if you take that approach, uh, uh, you're in trouble already. The teacher might respond with we have these examples, but the teacher will say millions of kalpas. Of course, most of us, I think maybe we know what a kalpa is, just in case you don't, a kalpa is just an enormous, a huge amount of time and described by pictures like uh, if you take a granite mountain, 40 miles high, 40 miles wide, and 40 miles deep block, you know. <laughs> and once every hundred years, a 
a celestial being will come down and drape their gown across the, just the edge of the rock and leave. And every hundred years. <laughs> and after that block is worn down to nothing, uh, that would be one kelpa. And uh, so the, if you ask a question like that about this practice, you know, well, how long? How long for what? What, what, are you, what are you thinking of? And uh, how long before what? I become enlightened or something like this? And whatever else you might have in mind. And the teacher will say a million kalpas. And I mean, oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> so long. This is to help you realize that this isn't a matter of time or how long. Time has nothing to do with it. But if you have an attitude like this, and you're looking for, you know, for some kind of measure here, and how long will it take me? Uh, you're never going to arrive. There's no place to arrive. You're already here. You know. So th this this is something that in the teachings, what's being pointed out here is that. Uh, it isn't a matter of time or it's going to take a long time or anything of this sort. You're looking at this in the completely, well, a way that is just off from what the situation is that we face here. And uh, so that's uh, <laughs> where most of us are. It, it is difficult for us to really understand what's being pointed out there because we'll still be locked in ideas of, well, I will practice for, you know, maybe after a few years or whatever, I might arrive. There's no place to arrive. There's nothing to get. We're told this over and over and over again, but it's like we don't believe it. And we'll still, still sit down and practice. You have to notice this in your own mind. You sit down and as you're sitting there in the back of your mind, you're maybe not consciously you know, working on it at the moment, but there's a kind of an attitude, a, you know, a, a leaning in your mind that this is about putting in my time here on the cushion or whatever to get somewhere. But as Jamie uh, says here, there's just no ending to this practice, is there? Yeah, there's no ending. Because it isn't a matter of arriving at some place. In each moment, it's just, we can get out. And we're searching for something. We're reaching for something. We're trying to figure something out. We're trying to achieve something, get somewhere. In our, the limited uh, you know, exchanges of our everyday life here and there, yeah, there's this sort of thing. This is what goes on in the world of this and that. But when it comes to this matter of waking up, realizing the nature of reality, that kind of thinking just doesn't work. It doesn't apply to this practice. Which then we might think, well, then, well, why then? Why do I sit? Why would I sit meditation? Yeah, well, yeah, we and we just keep it there <laughs> because we don't consider what's really going on in our mind that we have this idea that this is about getting somewhere, achieving something, figuring something out. And it, it just has nothing to do with that whatsoever. This is what we have to realize and realize it then even as we continue the practice. And of course, right there, you might have the question with them, but, but, but why, why would I practice? Yeah, well, that's an ordinary mind. And with that, there's no understanding. There's no awakening. There's no coming to realize the nature of reality. So, but that's what this teaching is about. That's what it's uh, pointing, pointing to. But then Jamie says, uh, um, he says, there just is no end to this practice. Because there is no end to things being taken to be things and then revealing themselves to be empty. And there's no end 
to this. This is not a fault or anything of that sort, because, uh, you know, we will, you know, take things to be things. Yeah, there's no end to this, to things being taken to be things. Yeah. We'll take things to be things. We don't realize, what, what do you mean? I don't take a thing to be thing. I'm holding this piece of paper here now. And uh, that's a thing. Yeah, okay. But we take it to be things, or a thought, or a feeling, uh, or a gesture, anything at all. But we think that whatever it is that's forming there in the mind now as a thing, something we might have a name for, maybe it's something totally new. We don't have any word for it. But maybe quickly if it recurs or other people experience such things, and we'll have words about this thing or that thing, some new thing, some novel thing that wasn't around before, no one ever thought of. But we'll put words to it, and that also intensifies <laughs> the thingness of it, you know, sharpens up the outline and, and the variations of it and all of this sort of thing. Because there's no end to things being taken a, uh, to be things. And then with this, then they reveal themselves. If you continue to just look at that, look at what's coming up in this moment, just staying with that, this doesn't involve words on your part, thinking anything, saying anything to yourself. In fact, that's how we keep missing everything, <laughs> missing the, the understanding, the realization of reality. That's because uh, we just can't keep our hands off. We're doing things. We're taking things to be things. And uh, it was interesting, uh, last week, uh, uh, Ben Connolly was here, and uh, he was talking about Vasubandhu. And uh, he, he studied quite a bit uh, that way and uh, in the Yogacara school, kind of an early psychology school um, in Buddhism. But he said once before at a talk here uh, that he said with Vasubandhu or, or the Yogacara way is to turn things into things. And yeah, because that's what we'll do. Now we can study them. We can uh, show the relationships between things and and manipulate them in various ways and multiply them and maybe destroy some and, and that sort of thing. But turning things into things, well, into dharmas is what they would do in the Abhidharma school. And that's perfectly, because this is what we tend to do. Uh, we'll turn things into things. And that's fine, but you better be careful to understand what you're doing with these things. Because as Jamie says here, um, uh, well, these things, they, they then will reveal themselves to be empty. Empty of any kind of substantiality. And I don't know that we even need to go about creating thingness about things. We're, we're already kind of there. But it's a matter of just, if we can learn to observe these things that are continuously showing. This is our conscious experience. And it is filled with things coming and going, thoughts and feelings of various things coming and going. But it's also just pure thoughts and feelings uh, with not too well-defined thingness about any, any of it. Uh, that's there too, but usually we'll miss it because we'll grasp the thing. We want to do something with the thing, even if what we want to do is to get rid of it. But we, and then that just solidifies it in the mind. I could say your mind, but then that's just uh, doing the same thing with your mind. That there's this thing called my mind, and uh, but it's just endless what we do. Instead of quietly just observing the thing. And as Jamie says here, that uh, yeah, things take them to be seen, but then they reveal themselves 
to be empty. Yeah, if we continue to just observe without labeling, without grasping, without trying to control or manipulate or do something with it. <laughs> yeah. But he says, uh, even this practice, so we will, these things will reveal themselves to be empty. Even the practice and the teaching itself. Yeah. Which is almost like one of those self destructing letters in spy movies that fills us up after reading. You know that image, I think. Uh, yet in the case of this practice, it never stops fizzling up. This sort of thing, the apparent thingness of things that then will reveal if we just dispassionately just observe that and realize it, it is empty of any kind of substantiality. Uh, this can be seen directly. Nothing to say about, nothing to figure out here. It's just simply to notice this about whatever it is you might be observing. Even now, you know, whether it's the floor or a thought or a feeling you might be, you know, having. Uh, and it isn't now, now you can maybe pay attention to the talk. You don't have to, but, uh, and then we can even take things that are being said here, different aspects of it and turn those into things as well. And that's fine. We do this and it's okay. But it's very helpful if you realize what you're doing. You start to notice what you're doing. And we do this constantly with everything, all the time. And so we carry on as if we're in a world of substantiality, a world of this and that. And in a sense, we are. It's just that <laughs> we'll miss the fact that these are the appearances, the appearances of things coming and going. If you look very carefully, you can't actually get hold of anything that's doing that. But it looks this way, it feels this way. Uh, and we can talk about it as if it were this way. And to a point, just getting on with our daily lives, it, a certain amount of that is necessary. But when the backdrop of our mind is that these things are ultimately an expression of what is ultimately real, and they, they are not. They're uh, an expression of mind. We'll be, uh, I'll be starting a class next week, well, not this coming week, but the following week on Tuesday, I believe, and uh, uh, called Mind and Consciousness, a no-brainer. <laughs> and uh, here we'll be looking at uh, some things of this sort. We think that mind is something produced by matter, by the brain. You know, a lot of us believe this. I did too, at one point, before I learned to really observe. And, uh, uh, but I'll, anyway, but that's what this class will be getting into, things of this sort. Uh, if that interests you, you might want to check it out. Um, but as Jamie says here now, so, but even the practice itself, it reveals itself, you know, uh, like one of these uh, self-destructing, it was like these uh, uh, self-destructing movies, it, you know, things fizzled up. Yet in the case of the practice, it never stops fizzling up. This world of stuff coming and going never stops fizzling up in this way. In other words, it's never, it's, it's constantly providing us with, with the opportunity to see, to realize that yes, here these things are coming and going, and yet, do we ever get hold of any of them? They fizzle up. They will reveal themselves to be empty of substantiality. Of course, when, they, when we're assuming that the world has to be carrying that substance with it, we think, well, then, well, then this is uh, nothingness. We'll interpret Nagarjuna's uh, shunyata emptiness as nothingness. But obviously this isn't nothing. This is fizzling up and <laughs> things taking place. But it's the very lack we can start to see directly without assuming substantiality. We can see that it's there's this lack of substantiality and, and it's this lack of sub substantiality that is mind, conscious experience. That's 
what we uh, are living out. Whether we, we're aware of it or not, whether we think this is so or not, or whether we're caught up with interpreting the appearances of things as having substantiality, before we learn to observe carefully that they're constantly showing us, you know, insubstantial, revealing themselves as, as emptiness or as being empty. Okay. So then, um, and so Jamie observes here that, so then the case of this practice, then we start to realize that it never stops fizzling up. Whatever it is we have here, if you hang on to it long enough, it'll kind of disintegrate. Now, many of these things are useful and helpful in our in our in our day to day lives, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but it would be all more more than helpful if we could start to realize that the apparent substantiality of it uh, is is just that an appearance. It's not actual substantiality, and we don't have to be tricked by this. Isn't is it, this isn't about doing away with it? You can't do that. Things keep fizzling up. Showing up and fizzling up. Uh, but we don't observe. We, we see the showing up and then we grant to them in our minds substantiality. And now we're trying to work with all of that. Rather than seeing the true nature of it is, this is changing. It's not going to stay put. It'll be gone. It really never quite arrived. Uh, we can observe that. We can finally see that. He says it's a... Uh, there really isn't an it to be found here, there, or anywhere. Yeah, no it here. <laughs> yeah, except we'll we'll make it into something, though, whatever it is. Yeah. Even the teaching will make it into something. Uh, we make you know, and he says here, there, but here, where's here? What this is me here? Yeah, we, we'll make that into something. It applies right here as well. But there, yeah, over there, that object, other people, whatever it might be. We'll turn all of these things in our mind. We'll, we'll treat them as if these are something particular. We'll apply a name to a person, to myself or something like this, or your, our parents have for us or whatever. And then it seems like now we, with, with that name, or label on objects or whatever, that kind of helps to keep us thinking that, well, that there's this thing that that uh, was appearing here yesterday and here it is again today. And everything will seem like this to us. And so but then we think that there's a thing there with carrying that label, not noticing that everything about whatever it is, a thought or a feeling, a person, a, a tree, the stars, whatever. Uh, but there's something here persisting. Were there, were, were that the case? No, nothing would make sense. And that's why the backdrop of our understanding of everything is kind of a mystery. But that isn't what's going on. It is because these things aren't carrying any, there's nothing being carried from moment to moment. There's just this appearance. And that the appearances themselves, if you look very carefully, are changing. Some are very apparent. Other things uh, are over eons of time we might not notice. But there's nothing holding still whatsoever. So there really isn't any it here. But we'll make things into something. We always want to put something there. That's, that's what we're doing. You have to start to notice how this is taking place. You know, and you come in, you come up to something that starts to seem kind of maybe mysterious. It would only seem mysterious because you think there's a thing there, but I can't quite say. Rather than seeing that there really isn't any particular thing there. Yes, if there were, it would be quite mysterious. All of this would be, and that's how the whole world looks to us as a mystery. Where did it all come from? Where did I come from? Where are we going? You know, and it's all a big mystery to us. And a lot of that is scary. <laughs> Drives us to behave in all kinds of ways that aren't particularly healthy as we interact with each other or with the environment or in any number of ways. And it's not that we can't interact. We, we have to interact. I mean, it's a, but 
we can see that the nature of what is being observed here from moment to moment is of a different sort than we naively think. And that changes everything. And there's nothing here that's really bearing or carrying any mystery. It's only when you put something there, whether it's myself or each, you know, me or some other thing, whatever. No, it's mystery, all kinds of questions. Where did it come from? Where is it going? What should we do about this or that? How do I find enlightenment? Just endless. All of this is uh, just our confusion from thinking that there is something there, there's an it there. And if we can't seem to find that it very easily or conveniently, we will put something there. <laughs> Plop a label on it if we can. If it seems to be, yeah, it's, it's still there. It's in, repeating in the next moment, the next day. Yeah. And then thinking that that is so. And yet, whoa, the thing is fading. The flower is fading. You know, the rock is being eaten away, chipped away too. Everything is changing. But uh, that makes us feel sad. And yet, <laughs> that very thing that might make us feel sad or frightened even a bit is the very thing that's, that is this life, this vibrancy, this vi vitality, this energy. Energy itself is not a thing. Uh, you know, something you can contempl contemplate that too a little bit and see where you go with that. Uh, but but here it is. So my teacher used to say, you know, about anything at all, here it is. What is it? But see, we'll put something there immediately. And then maybe we'll answer that. Well, what? Well, that's a whatever, an apple. You know? And, uh, you know, that's what we'll do. And then we we'll feel kind of satisfied. And that, that kind of works in a limited sort of way. That's handy and useful to use terms like this. But in the backdrop of our mind, there's this belief that this has actually captured something here, that the world is frozen in that way. The world is not at all frozen. It's energy, you could say, or it's mind. But then uh, Jamie goes on here. He says, over time, insanity reveals itself. Yeah, if, if you continue to look <laughs> in time, this insanity, because it is kind of insanity. It's like we're not really in touch with reality. It's, it's this image of reality. It's this, uh, well, it's this conceptualized reality. Uh, just conceptualized truth, ideas and thoughts. Of course, we'll, things as well. These are also conceptual. And uh, it's what's been put together. And we'll think by my mind, maybe. Because it's in my mind. And so, you know, my mind is uh, what putting it together. Or we think of my mind as taking in things that already are put together, but they're out there and I'm taking them in through my senses and all of this. But there's a lot of confusion there. And, uh, and as it all comes in <laughs> to our minds, it's all rather mysterious. We use some of it to get along in life and that sort of thing, but some of this stuff fills us with, uh, well, sometimes great elation, but also uh, sorrow, and, you know, fear, anxiety. Uh, but it always remains mystery because that isn't really what's the nature of what's actually taking place which we do see, this is our perceptual experience. We do see reality, but we think. Dogen, this is what Dogen, he'll say, cease from practice based on intellectual, conceptual understanding. You know, following words, chasing after speech. We just look right here and just see. There's no need to grasp anything. But be aware, here it is, showing up, behaves this way, whatever. You know, it, at least it appears to. But then Jamie says, over time, insanity reveals itself. 
the insanity of departing from here, looking for something to bring back to here. Yeah. <laughs> here it is. Yeah. We think here it is, you know. So I'll I'll leave here, right here where there is no thing. No, there's the appearances of things, but I'll leave here and I'll go over there where that thing appears to be and I'll take hold of it now in some way. And then we want to bring it back here. When it comes to the teaching, you had mentioned the teachings here in the practice. And we'll make that into a thing and then we'll want to bring it here. And maybe in teaching then, so I'll find a way to hand this to you, you know. But then teaching, we don't really do it. You're never handed anything. Things are just pointed out to you. I'm not trying to give you ideas here. Just pointing out, trying to help you to notice for yourself. Even though there's no yourself, but just to wake up to the nature of what is actually unfolding here with no substance to it. We don't then have to carry on as if, well, I'm nothing at all. I can get up and walk through this table or something like that. No, the appearances are such that, well, we know what would happen if one tried to walk into a table. And uh, so we, we we don't. We don't have to, you know, because there, there we're still taking the stuff to be something, even if you think, well, okay, then so it's nothing. I can walk through it. But in doing that, we actually, you know, perpetuate the, the appearance of somethingness about it. We think there's an it there because we always want to put something there. But whatever it is, even the table, you'll never really get hold of it. You say, yeah, I can look at that. I can touch it and move it. But what is it? You never get hold of it. Yeah. But in time, the sanity reveals itself, and he says the insanity of departing from here, you know, looking for something to bring back to here. Yeah, we'll leave here, here where you can't really get hold of it. We can see this and live with that, even though, yes, th there appears to be a table here. It's best if I don't carry on as if there weren't a table here. But at the same time, you can't really say there's a table here. What is it? See, this is what's so difficult for us, is to realize that that's the experience. We think, well, either there's a table here or there isn't. Boom, boom. It's just frozen. The fluidity of life, which is conscious life, uh, is such that it's lost to us. Now, well, it becomes a mystery. We know there is such a thing in most cases, but it's now something mysterious. And it must be because we really think that the real stuff here is the physical stuff, the material stuff, and the brain is produced by the mind, or the mind is produced by the brain. It's closer to the other way around, but <laughs> we'll look at that in this class. But um, now with all of that, pardon me, Uh, we, we seem to have mystery. Then he says, also, there's the insanity of thinking that thinking can see better than seeing can. Yeah. So we have the insanity of, okay, we leave here. Oh, I was going to say this too. So we leave here. Here is where we, this is our perceptual experience. We ignore this. We essentially leave it. But you can't really leave it. But we just ignore it. And start carrying on uh, believing in the substantiality of things. And then we want to bring that, you know, here. So now we have it. We understand. But you can't. You can't do that. It will never reveal itself as something substantial, whatever it might be. And so, uh, uh, so we'll leave here. In other words, we'll kind of give up the direct perceptual experience, the direct seeing, realizing of the true nature of reality, which you do, we all have this. But we go over to, you know, to pick it up and have, now we've created a thing. 
an idea, a thought, an emotion, a feeling, a taste, whatever it might be. And, and then we think that, they, well, it's real enough. It seems real enough. These appearances, they're real enough. That is the reality. That's the, the everyday reality, the reality of birth and death, the samsaric world. But ultimately, that isn't really what's taking place here. But ultimately, what's taking place, what seems like you can't get hold of it, and then like it's nothing. You know, yeah, well, it's true. Yeah, you can't get hold of it. But it isn't nothing. It is what is being experienced. It's just that. It's just that it's not holding a substance. A substance. So, but we feel like we can, um, uh, we're, we're looking for something. Uh, we depart from here, the actual immediate direct experience, and then we, we uh, look for something to bring back to here. So I want to bring the, the stuff that I think or feel or taste or whatever and bring it back here. And in enlightenment, I've heard about that, and, well, and we think we have to bring it back here, so now I have it. Yeah, you know, that's kind of how we carry on, not realizing, well, there's no need for having. I mean, what do you think this is? It's a matter of waking up, that's all. It's not a matter of getting or figuring it out. This is vital, what I'm trying to point out to you here. And what you have to do is notice yourself trying to figure it out or trying to get it in some way. And, and there's, of course, there's also me here, not noticing that, well, I am not something found either. Uh, but when we see that and think that's real, then here I am looking at that or tasting that or whatever. And, uh, and there we are. Again, we're, we're lost. We will leave here the immediacy of just this and uh, uh, go over there to you know, get something and then try to bring it back here. Uh, but this is just, that's insanity, as Jamie says here. And he also says the, the insanity of thinking that thinking can see better than seeing can. So, yeah, we want to think our way to this, what it is that we're pointing out here. And... Uh, again, we want to put something, we think there's something to this. And that thinking, you know, can see better, because this is just a matter of seeing, but just seeing, objectless seeing, realizing, a direct realization of what is taking place here, without making particularness, things out of whatever is taking place here. And yet, the appearances are here, they don't go anywhere, they're constantly here, coming and appearing to come and go. Nothing to do about that. But it's a matter of what we're talking about here is a matter of finally realizing what's actually, what the experience actually is. It is of this nature. And there's a, a lot to this. Again, I'll, in, in the class I'll be doing pretty soon, uh, we, we get into, into this a bit. But, uh, but thinking doesn't uh, see better than seeing can. It's just it's just seeing. It's not seeing and then thinking because right away our no ordinary seeing is latched uh, or immediately latches onto something. I see the zafu, and uh, yeah. So there's here I am, and then but the, I have an eye, and it's seeing that over there, and the eye is uh, a thing that's solid, real, and the thing over there is, and there's grasping and whole. Yeah, these are the if, if we saw that as appearances. It looks this way. It seems this way. But the moment you try to go in and parse any of that out and get hold of something, you can't do it. It isn't of that nature. It's a matter of just realizing this. But you And you can't realize it intellectually. You can't realize it as an idea. I've given you the idea about this, but that's not good enough. It's not actually experiencing just this. Directly, but the experience of just this is taking place even now for you. Well, exactly, not exactly for you, because you were part of the thing that seems to be appearing here. Yeah. But this is something that we, you know, I say weaken. There's no awakener to this, but this is what awakeness is. The awakened, when they speak, they speak out of seeing this, knowing this. That this is the nature. Of the of, of this experience here, with seeing, realizing directly the true nature of what is experienced, 
pretty much everything will be resolved. I will say everything, except that implies things again. <laughs> okay. This is why also why Dogen, and he says, you know, when Jamie says here, uh, uh, the insanity of thinking that thinking can see better than thinking than seeing can. Uh, Dogen, he tells us, think not in the Fukanza Zengi, think not thinking. Yeah. So the, the, rather than having an intellectual grasp of this, you know, let the thinking be just thinking, which is not thinking in our usual way of getting ideas, operating from ideas. Uh, it's not operating from anything, but it is just living out of what is being lived out. Um, and understanding the nature of just this rather than the innate, the nature of this and that. I said just this rather than this and that. This and that are things. Just this. It's not a thing. But it can be seen. Okay, and then he also says the, the insanity of uh, things can actually, uh, the things can actually self-exist and that therefore there can be enduring mystery and opacity. Yeah, things self-exist, but that they are something unto themselves, persisting, yeah, to self-exist, exist. Again, most of the time, I think we could just take that word exist, whatever it is we're assuming there, if you look carefully at your thoughts of well, what it is, what do you mean by exist, you'll see persistence in the, the assumption of persistence Persistence is in when we use that term "exist." The presumption of exist of a pers uh, of a persistence is there, but there's nothing uh, that's. If we look carefully again, we will notice there's nothing persisting to any of this. Not to a thought, to a feeling, not to objects, whatever they might be, to people we know, even to whatever. Uh, ideas we have of me, self, the sense we have of, of self. It's real enough, yeah, this sense of self, but it's not ultimately real. And there's nothing about it that's persisting. Uh, whatever it is about you now, it wasn't uh, the person who stepped into this room a while ago. Uh, there's nothing persisting here. Okay. But then with this, uh, the thing that when we think that things that actually self-exist, uh, now with this, now, <laughs> now we're paving the way here uh, for uh, this enduring mystery. The things will continue to be uh, this mysterious nature, which I've already mentioned a bit here, and opaque. You know, we can't clearly see what's taking place here, what's going on uh, here. And then and, and Jamie says that, and so the insanity of the enduring spiritual search. Yeah, the insanity of the enduring spiritual search. Boy, it's getting later, and I thought I was going to say a bit about this. But um, yeah, this spiritual search. Buddhas do not seek. And then, be good, be helpful, maybe, for you to remember that the Buddhists, what's that? Well, that people who are awake, it's not even people, but, but this awakeness is not a matter of searching. To awaken to this reality, to not be fooled by it, deceived by it, or confused by it, to actually see true knowing, you know, just this. Uh, with this, uh, there, there's no searching. Anytime there's searching, there is, just if you can try keep this in mind or just notice it when you might be searching for something, whether you're searching for your keys or for the deep mystery of life or whatever it might be. Uh, but with searching, notice that there's a thing there. And there's a thing here searching for that out there. Okay, this is searching involves that. With what we're talking about here, there's, there's no search. Buddhas do not search. Those who awaken to this 
reality are not searching. They're not seekers. And uh, so this is what uh, seeking reveals. It doesn't mean do not seek. It's been said that, you know, uh, but without seeking, you, you won't find it. Or, or so, But there's nothing to find either. But uh, so we, the seeking is okay. It's just that realize that what that means is that you're looking for something. And you will easily, easily do it. You will put something there. Whether it's the truth of the Holy Gospel or, the, or whatever it might be. The most mundane little truth, there's a paper in my hand. We'll put something there. And we go searching for that. And then some of these things we can easily find. Other things, you know, like a long mystery. <laughs> And a long enduring search. And he says this enduring search, this enduring spiritual search. Yeah. That's all because we we insist on putting something there. Um, that's something uh, you, you need, if you can learn to pay attention to that, get a sense of what, what that is, what I'm trying to point to here. That about all of us, me too. I mean, I had to notice this. But looking for something, looking for something. So finally, like in my case a bit, I, I ask myself, what do I think? I'm, what do I think I'm going to find? And there's something wrong with this whole picture. And it's kind of like learn to kind of back off, you know, because I, as I try to imagine what well, enlightenment, would that be like this or that? Or, you know, or I'd read Wang Po or... Is he, so is he talking about and I'm just looking for trying to get an image there of something oh okay now if I could just see that or figure that out just realize uh, that that's not involved with with seeing there's just simply no searching searching is making up something and searching too will always have mystery involved with it with seeing there's no mystery with just Seeing, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about seeing objects, seeing thoughts, seeing ideas. Oh, I get it. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, it, it, nothing like that. That's where, where it involves a formed thing. It's just, and it's, it's a very quiet thing. You can notice it just like this, maybe. Just sitting here. You can realize that this isn't nothing. It isn't like there's blankness here. No color, no sound, no feeling, no sense of dimension, time, space, whatever. The moment there appears to be something, all of these things are, appear with it. But if we just sit here, you realize uh, that we don't even have these things at all. It's just simply a matter of waking, waking up to that. But all these things are appearing. This is what consciousness is. Uh, it's an aspect of mind. Or this true reality. Mind with a capital M. Not mind as we might think of it. It's like my mind. My mind. Your mind. That's a thing we're talking about there. And again, a formed thing. And, I, you know, and it's, you know, we can, something like that. We'll even try to locate it. Isn't that kind of silly in a way? <laughs> I used to wonder about that. I don't anymore. I can see, but, but uh, like, w w where is your mind? Of course, we'll point to the brain. You know, you know, I I say, forget that. Don't do that. That's almost kind of silly. Well, we'll you'll see why. If you take the course, I'm going to do it. Maybe <laughs> I'll help you know. But that's sort of a silly thing. It doesn't if you because you, you can see directly. Even your mind doesn't have. A location in space uh, doesn't have a position in time either. Now the things, if you say, I really see this, so then I'll think, think about the implications of your birth and your death and your location, what in the universe. <laughs> There's a lot here that would just will drop away. The silliness of it will drop away with just seeing. 
And then, of course, but here it is. Okay, so things are showing up again. Maybe you can see that it's showing up because of the lack of substance. That's what this is. It's just, but it's a matter of just seeing that. It's not a matter of getting the idea. Of, it isn't going to help you. It's just another thing. We have the idea of well, what I just said. You can form that into some image or something. But that's not it. So, so don't go looking. Don't seek. Buddhists don't seek. They, that's, these are the people that finally stopped. And it's a matter of just right here. Uh, and don't be holding yourself there either. I gave a talk a little while ago using that teaching of that, uh, what is it, enlightenment. Uh, there's a story, Indian story, of how enlightenment that uh, people were searching for enlightenment. <laughs> what enlightenment, what was it? Oh, the enlightenment tree, that's what it was, yeah. So we have an image of the tree. But uh, they were searching everywhere, but nobody was finding it. But the enlightenment tree, the tree of enlightenment, grows on the mountain of egolessness. Just kind of keep that in mind too. That it's I'm I want to find this. I'm looking. Just drop it. What do you, if if you, if you must, well then take a look. What do you mean by I? You can try to answer that if you want, but at some point maybe what's helpful is that you realize what are you going to put there? What are you going to put there? That's going to be the answer. That's going to satisfy anything. Whatever you put anywhere will not satisfy. The deep ache of the heart, the vast mystery of the mind. It's just a matter of realizing this. Not intellectually, not as an idea. I've given you the idea, but that's an, just sit there. See for yourself. Well, just <laughs> not even see your language. It keeps forcing me to say things I don't really mean to say. But uh, yeah. So, uh, but this is very good. The insanity of thinking that things can actually self-exist and that therefore there can be enduring mystery and opacity. And so the insanity of the enduring spiritual search. Yeah. Anyway, this, this fellow here, Jamie, Jamie Douglas, uh, he often sends me uh, little pieces like this and uh, or his musings, he has questions and he says, hey, well, we, we dialogue too a little bit, we talk. But um, very interesting uh, uh, fellow. Uh, and uh, if you're out there, Jamie, right now, uh, thank you very much for this. <laughs> okay, We're almost out of time. There's any questions or comments by anybody? Yeah, leave it. A long time ago, we used to say two years enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew where you got that number. <laughs> okay. 80 years. How's that? A kelpa. I don't know. No, it's this is enlightened. It's like this. And uh, well, when, when will that happen? Well, okay. If you're looking like that, you know, yeah, two years at least. Probably, if you continue, if you have, after two years you're still carrying on like that, uh, no, it's going to take forever. Well, or a million kalpas. <laughs> That's the same as forever, really. And the Indians, when they they use a big number like that, they're really talking about forever. But it isn't a matter of that. I was trying to say at the beginning, it isn't a matter of while well, searching and trying to get somewhere to recognize what you're doing. There's the insanity and stop. Just stop that. Wake up. It's like, like this. It isn't suddenly getting the idea, oh, it's this or that. No, if it were this or that, we're still locked in this frozen prison of thinking that there's solid things here and there and me relating to it. It's a matter of just see the error of that. It's all it is. But to truly see and seeing not with the eyes and everything, this is what I mean by just seeing. It's not me. I did, I, I'm not the only one to use this term. 
got this from other teachers. But it is uh, just, just seeing. Not seeing that, not seeing this, not seeing an object. It's just a matter of waking up, realizing. This knowledge you know, is not something far away from you. You're living it out right now. It actually is your immediate direct perceptual experience. And so, so it isn't something you have to get or acquire. You already have it, so to speak, except the you part. But that's when we're talking like this, now we're conceptualizing and it gets cluttered up with all that kind of stuff. But settle your mind, quiet your mind. Don't think. And there it is. It's possible. Well, you do experience this actually probably all the time, many times. And I was, well, I don't, uh, I don't want to talk about my experience, actually. But it is possible. I just wanted to say something like, uh, it's possible to finally really realize what's going on and yet not really realizing this in terms of enlightenment. Or that this is a Nagarjuna meant by emptiness. But in time, um, it'll all start to become obvious what the, the awakened teachings are offering. Uh, not everything that we read, even in Buddhism and Zen, is of an enlightened mind. But it'll start to become obvious what things are actually pointing and what things are still inviting us to grasp. But any, any, well, we are virtually out of time, so if there's nothing else, I guess we'll end it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.